We are a species with amnesia. Graham Hancock. Greetings, mortals, and a bright and sunny day to you all. I'm your host, Simon. Welcome back to the Library of Gnosis. We need only to look at all the amazing ancient cyclopean stone monuments around the world to see that we have lost a big part of our collective human history. And we are now only beginning to uncover it. I wish to aid with this, so today we will be exploring a forgotten part of our history as a species. And what better place to start than the most ancient culture I know of. This culture was broadly referred to as the Scythians. Now some say they may even be the ancestors of the Sumerians, which would make them possibly the oldest culture we know of. They were one of an ancient nomadic race living on the steppes of southern Russia. Scythia as a name anciently given to the region along the north coast of the Black Sea and extending definitely north from Skyth, a Scythian, said to be from an Indo-European root meaning shepherd. Isn't that a coincidence, when I have been covering our favorite good shepherd Hermes so much? Today I will be covering the Scythian religion, and it came as a surprise to me that they basically worshipped the same gods as the modern day mystery schools. According to Herodotus, the Scythians worshipped a pantheon of seven gods and goddesses, which he equates with the Greek divinities of classical antiquity. Herodotus mentioned eight deities divided into three ranks. In the first rank was the head of the pantheon, Tapati, the flaming one, who was the goddess of heat, fire and the hearth, and was equated by Herodotus with the Greek goddess of the hearth, Hestia. The Scythian goddess Tapati was equated by Herodotus with the Greek goddess of the hearth Hesia. Tapati was the most venerated out of all Scythian deities. The name Tapati meant the burning one or the flaming one. The Sanskrit term Tapas, which denoted the cosmic warmth and the original nature, this is the cosmic principle out of which originated the multiple elements of the universe and the order in the world. Thus, Tapati was the primordial fire which alone existed before the creation of the universe. And from her were born Api, the earth, and Papaios, heaven. Due to being a deity representing an abstract notion of fire and divine bliss, Tapati was rarely depicted in Scythian earth, but instead was represented by the fireplace which constituted the sacral center of any community, from the family to the tribe. The connections of our name to fire and warmth, as well as her role as the primordial fire, attest of the role of Tapati as a primordial sovereign deity of fire derived from the common fire deity of the Indo-Europeans, whose iterations included the Greek Hestia. Tapati was thus similar to the Vedic Agni and the Greek Hestia, although she belonged to an older period in the development of Indo-Iranian religion compared to other Iranian peoples and the Indo-Aryans, among whom she had been respectively replaced by the male fire gods Atar and Agni, making her the only attested female Indo-European fire deity Herodotus' listing of Tapati at the head of the Scythian pantheon was a reflection of the role of the fire deity among Indo-European peoples and parallels the Greek tradition of beginning and ending every sacrificial rite with the sacrifice to Hestia. Also attesting of the paramount role of the fire deity in Iranian pantheon as an omnipresent element, Tapati was the primordial fire which was the basic essence and the source of all of creation. A concept which was also present among the Indo-Aryan pantheon, where Agni was the fire which could be found throughout the cosmos and which permeated the whole universe, including the worlds of the humans and of the gods. The status of the Pati as the incarnation of the primordial fire is also confirmed by the story recounted by Gnaeus Pompeius Trogus 
of the dispute which arose between the Scythians and the Egyptians for the right to the title of the most ancient people, and which consisted of an argument by each side about whether the world was initially fully flooded by water, referring to none of, or covered with fire, referring to Tapati. As a goddess of the hearth, Tapati was a patron of society, the state, and families who protected the family and the clan, and as a symbol of supreme authority. She was assigned the superior position over the other gods through a role as the guardian of the king, due to which, as well as her link to the common Iranian cult of fire, she was connected to the importance of fire and of royal hearts in Iranian religions. The king's hearth was hence connected with Tapati, and was therefore an inviolable symbol of the prosperity of his people, and a token of royal power. And Tapati herself was connected with royal power, as attested by the Scythian king, Hidan Tiresis, calling her the Queen of the Scythians in 513 BCE. With this characterization of Tapati being possibly linked with the notion of the Farna, the Iranian divine bliss, or even that of the fire which protects the king, the Varaharan. As the guardian of the royal heart, Tapati therefore ensured the well-being of the tribe, an oath by the royal hearts was considered the most sacred, and breaking it was believed to cause the king's illness and was punished by death. The Hestia of Tapati were likely the flaming gold objects which fell from the sky in the Scythian genealogical myth, and of which the king was the trustee while Tapati herself, in turn, was the protector of the king and of the royal hearth, thus creating a strong bond between Tapati and the Scythian king, who might have been seen as an intermediary between the goddess and the people, and any offense to the royal Hestiae was considered as affecting the whole tribe and had to be averted at any cost. In the second rank were binary opposites, the father and the mother of the universe, Api, the earth and water mother, equated by Herodotus with the Greek goddess of the earth, Gaia, and Papaios, the sky father, equated by Herodotus with the Greek god, Zeus. The Scythian goddess of the birth-giving, Chthonic principle, was Api or Apia, which is reflected by her name, Api which was a Scythian cognate of the Avestan word for water, Api, and through her equation by Herodotus with the Greek goddess of the earth, Gaia, these identifications rested upon the conceptualization in ancient cosmologies of earth and water as being two aspects of the same birth-giving Chthonic principle, and within Iranian tradition, the earth was a life-giving principle which was instinctively connected to water, which was held to have fertilizing, nourishing and healing properties. The name Api was also linked to child talk and daring word meaning mommy, with these various connections of Api and her name painting the consistent picture of her as a primordial deity from whom was born the world's first inhabitants. Api was the consort of Papaios, with the two of them being the children of Tapati, the primordial fire. Api and Papaios initially existed together in an inseparable unity until their union, which reflected the Indo-Iranian tradition of the marriage between heaven and earth as the basis for the creation of the world, and parallels the union between Ahura Mazda and the earth goddess Armati in the Avesta. This gave birth to the middle world, that is, the airspace, the part of the cosmos where humanity and all physical beings lived, and the gods of the third rank of the Scythian pantheon, who was associated with the quote-unquote middle world. This strikes me as being similar to the Norse creation story with Niflheim and Muspelheim. In the north, Niflheim formed. It became such a dark and cold place that there was nothing else than ice, frost and fog. 
to the south of Genungap, the realm of Muthelheim formed. This became the land of fire, and it became so hot that it would only consist of fire, lava and smoke. From Muthelheim in the south came lava and sparks into the great void, Ginnungap. In the middle of Ginnungap, which is the old Norse for gaping abyss or yawning void, the air from Niflheim and Muspelheim met. Perhaps it should come as no surprise, as through genetic testing of Scythian gravesites, they have come to the conclusion that their genetics most closely match the genetics of the Scandinavian peoples, so they are in fact the ancestors of the people who would later come to tell these same stories of creation. The completion of this process of cosmogenesis created an ordered universe made up of three zones, a cosmic one, a central one and a chthonic one, located each above the other. The birth of Dargathala from the union of Api and Papois thus represented the creation of the central sphere of the cosmos that lay between the celestial and chthonic realms. As a primordial goddess who gave birth to the first inhabitants of the world, Api remained aloof from worldly affairs and did not interfere with them after the creation of the world and the establishment of the proper order. The worship of Api by Scythian peoples is attested in Strabon's mention that the Derbiks worshipped Mother Earth. The name Api strikes me as being very similar to the Sumerian Absu, which is the name for the fresh water from the underground aquifers which was given a religious fertilizing quality in Sumerian and Akkadian mythology. Lakes, springs, rivers, wells and other sources of fresh water were thought to draw their water from the Absu. In Sumerian and Akkadian mythology, it is referred to as the primeval sea below the void space of the underworld Kur and the earth Ma above. Then we get to her male counterpart, Papois, whose original Scythian name is still uncertain. Who was the personification of heaven? The Scythian equivalent of the Zoroastrian great god Ahura Mazda, the consort of the earth goddess Api, and was therefore equated by Herodotus with the Greek god Zeus. The original Scythian form of the name Papaios is uncertain and has been variously interpreted as meaning either father or guardian or protector. Papaios was the consort of Api with the two of them being the children of Tapati, the primordial fire. Papaios and Api gave birth to the middle world, that is the part of the cosmos where humanity and all physical beings lived, and to the gods to the third rank of the Scythian pantheon, who were associated with the middle world. The completion of this process of cosmogenesis created an ordered universe, the birth of Dargatav, from the union of Papois and Api thus represented the creation of the central sphere of the cosmos that lay between the celestial and chthonic realms. According to Origenes of Alexandria, the Scythians considered the Papios to be a supreme god. The third and final rank was composed of four deities with specific characteristics. The Scythian Heracles, whose Scythian name was Dargatava was the forefather of the Scythian kings. The Scythian god Dargatava, meaning whose might is far-reaching, appears in the Greek recollections of the Scythian genealogical myth, where he was called the Scythian Heracles by Herodotus. Although he was not the same as the Greek hero Heracles, Dargatava Skua was born of the union of Papois and a daughter of the river Varustana, and he was the divine ancestor of the Scythians. Then we come to the Scythian Ares, the god of war. The Scythian Ares, that, that is the Scythian war god equated by Herodotus with the Greek god Ares, and might possibly have been an offspring of Tapati. The Scythian and the Sumerian Ares was represented by an Asenasi sword planted upwards at the top of a tall square altar made of brushwood of which Three sides were vertical and the fourth was inclined to allow access to it. The Scythian Ares was given blood sacrifices, and his representation in the form of a sword 
or evidence of his military function. The Scythian Ares was also a god of kingship, and the use of horses and of the blood and the right arms of prisoners in his cult was a symbolic devotion of the swiftness of horses and the strength of men to this god who had similar powers. The square shape of the altar of the Scythian Ares represented the four-sided middle world, that is, the airspace, and the sword placed at its top represented the world axis, which represented the vertical structure of the universe and connected its cosmic, central and chthonic zones. The altar of the Scythian Ares was thus a model of the universe as conceptualized within Scythian cosmology most and represented especially its central zone, the airspace. The tallness of the mound which acted as the altar to the Scythian Ares, as well as a practice of throwing the right arms of prisoners sacrificed to him in the sky, are evidence of the celestial nature of the Scythian Ares as a god of the airspace. That is, the practice of throwing these sacrificed arms in the air indicated that the Scythian Ares was also associated with gods of the sky and wind. This is also recorded in the works of the Greek author Lucinus, who recorded that the Scythians worshipped the wind and the swords as gods, referring to the dual nature of the Scythian Ares as a god of both the wind which brings life and the sword which brings death. The dual nature of this god is also visible in the Achinases used to represent him being shaped like a phallus, thus being a deadly weapon which is also shaped in the form of a life-giving organ. According to the Decius Sulimirsky, this form of worship continued among the descendants of the Scythians, the Alanoi, through the 4th century AD. This tradition may be reflected in Lordanes' assertion that Attila the Hun was able to assert his authority over the Scythians through his possession of a particular blade, referred to as the Sword of Mars. The hero Batyras from the Ossetian Narti Kagite might have originated from the Scythian Ares. In the sagas, Batyras appears as a brave but uncontrolled warrior living in the airspace and sometimes took the form of a whirlwind, who often protected his people from multiple enemies, who was made of steel and connected to a sword, which provided him with immortality so long as it remained unbroken, thus being the incarnation of Batyras himself. Koitosaurus might have been associated with the sun, and was equated by Herodotus with the Greek solar deity Apollo, Herodotus mentioned that the Masagetai worshipped only the sun god, to whom they sacrificed horses, which refers to the cult of the supreme sun god Mithra, who was associated with the worship of fire and horses, the Avestan form being an epithet of Mithra as the lord of cattle land. This is a deity of cattle culture widely worshipped by the common people in Scythian society. The first term composing his name, Gaitha meaning herd and possession, is cognate of Avestan, Gaiotois meaning cow pasture, and reflects the nature of Apollo, Goitsurus as a hallucination of the Iranian deity Mithra, and the second element Sura meaning strong and mighty. Due to his connection of Goitsosaurus and his identification with the Greek god Apollo, he has been identified with Mithra. Although this identification is largely tentative, with the multiple functions of Apollo contributing to this uncertainty, depictions of a solar god with a radiated head and riding a carriage pulled by two or four horses on numerous pieces of art found in Scythian burials from the 3rd century BC and later might have been representations of Goitosaurus. Altimapasa was a more complex goddess, who was a patron of fertility with the power of her sovereignty and the priestly forces, and was equated by Herodotus with Aphrodite Urania. Aphrodite Urania was an epithet of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, signifying heavenly or spiritual, to distinguish her from her more earthly aspect of Aphrodite Pandemos. 
Atmipasa was a complex androgynous Scythian goddess of fertility who possessed power over sovereignty and the priestly forces. Atmipasa was a goddess of warfare, sovereignty, priestly forces, vegetation and fertility, and was a Scythian variant of the Iranian goddess Artsi, Asi, who was a patron of fertility and marriage, and a guardian of laws who represented material wealth in its various forms including domestic animals, previous objects and plentiful descendants. Artmipasa had also been influenced by the Iranian goddess Amahita, the Assyrian Babylonian Istar and by the Thracian great mother goddess Bendis, thus making her an altogether complex deity. Artmipasa was thus equated by Herodotus with the Greek goddess Aphrodite Urania, who herself presided over productivity in the material world. An eighth Scythian deity mentioned by Herodotus was Tagimasadas, whom he equated with the Greek goddess Poseidon and who was worshipped only by the royal Scythians. Tagimasadas was a god worshipped only by the tribe of the royal Scythians. Tagmasada was thus not a member of the pan Scythian hepatistic pantheon and was likely the tribal and ancestor deity of the royal Scythians. The name of this deity is uncertain and an element of the god's name might have been derived from the Iranian term Masata meaning great and the Vedic Sanskrit term Tvax meaning to create by putting into motion. Herodotus identified Tagismadas with the Greek god Poseidon because both Tagismadas and Poseidon were horse tamer deities, but also because among the Athenians who were his audience, Poseidon was identified with Erechthinos, whom the Athenians considered their mythical ancestor, similar to how Tagi Masados was believed to be the ancestor of the royal Scythians. The equation of Tagismadas with Poseidon might also have been due to his possible role as a fashioner of the sky and hence was connected to sky waters and thunderbolts just like the Greek myth. The Scythian image of a winged horse inspired from that of the Greek Pegasus might have been connected to Tagismadas. The Scythians also used psychoactive intoxicants in their ritual practice. The Scythians ritually used the vapors of the hemp plant as an intoxicant. And also of note, in June 2020, the Guardian reported that Israeli archaeologists say they found cannabis residue and artifacts from an ancient temple in southern Israel, providing the first evidence of the use of hallucinogenics in ancient Jewish religion. Anyways, this has been a long video and we've covered a lot. That is good. I've been looking for a really interesting topic for a while now, so I'm glad this showed up. If you're interested about learning more about the Scythians, I highly recommend checking out Asha Logo's video on them. If you want to support my work, you can find me on Patreon, where you can get access to all my written materials. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time mortals.